Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Circularity Edge podcast. My name is Ken Alston and today my guest is Lanx. Welcome Lanx. Hi Ken, nice to see you. So Always Lanx, a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that we, we've reconnected. I know you've been on your travels for a little while and now you're back in London and you've got a major global initiative that we're going to talk about today called Sustained Credits and I think Am I right in saying you call yourself the chief executive philosopher of sustained credits? Yeah, well, I did, but I found that it rubbed people the wrong way at this specific stage of the business. So I changed it back to the creator, which is basically well, I sort of created it. But I like the word philosopher because an officer is just someone who's doing a job. A philosopher would think about what's happening in the long term and beyond as well. So every decision has repercussions. So I prefer to go by that title, but again, that's, that's you have to be mindful of the audience. Yeah, that's understandable. I, funnily enough, just five minutes ago, I finished recording a short video that I'm going to post on YouTube and on my website, all about the what I call the thinking one percent. So I'm I'm completely with you that you know we're we're looking for people who actually do think. There's a lot of people who don't, and we're we're looking for ones who who do and who who care about this wonderful planet that we happen to live on. So, so tell us tell us a little bit about what what you're up to, what is sustained credits, and how did you you know come to, to start it? Okay, where do I begin? Uh, I'll start with a bit about myself. I'm originally Sri Lankan. I moved to the UK when I was 18. My background is sort of computer science, maths, so I sort of think in systems and everything has to be complete. No, it's I, I don't like loose ends, so that sort of governs all my actions, essentially. So I set up a business when I was 23, 24, did that for 10 years, and I didn't like what it had become, and I realized, you know, you know nothing when you're at 24, you know, you just chase money. So I decided to do something that is beneficial to the world that we live in and see if I can help in my little way to the problems that I see. And... And sustained credits was born. It's part of my new company, which and the philosophy is quite similar to what sustained credits is. But I'll give you a brief overview of what sustained credits is. It's a reward system for people to restore nature. Because if you look at the world right now, that's nature degrading nature in all its forms, like climate change, which everyone knows about, but that's not the only one. There's a whole bunch of other elements as well. That's the most pressing issue of our time. And what actions people can take, it's usually don't turn off the lights, don't fly, don't eat meat, lots of restrictive, uh, which is fine. I mean, that's sort of a prevention thing as well, but there needs to be a bit of a carrot. You know, you can't always have stick. And that's the essence of sustained credits. And just taking a little bit beyond that is there's a, there's a vision where if people can get paid to restore nature, then lots of these systemic things that are around to prevent damage to nature will go away. Because right now, everyone, like it or not, you economic systems are tied to taking value from nature. But with 8 billion and at this pace of growth, it's not sustainable. But if there was an alternative system where people can get paid for restoring nature, that's sort of sustained price now. That is very, that's very ambitious in a in a broad spectrum. But that's sort of the vision, and that's sort of the goalpost. Um, and along the way, there's a lot of you know tiny little things that are more relevant. So that's the guiding light, and that's what sustained price is. I you know when I speak to people, particularly when I speak at universities to young people, the question I most often get is. I understand what you're telling me about this issue and the problems, but what can I do? And so there, there is a sense of that, you know, the, the sust sustainability issues are all global and that we're all individual. And there's a big gap between those two. And, and my sense is that you're trying to bridge that gap. And so you, you're providing a mechanism for people individually and collectively to actually do something that's beneficial and to be rewarded for it. Does that sound right? That's the vision. And uh, just to elaborate a little bit on that, there's lots of actions that people can take. 
for example, if you want to help the climate and say biodiversity, you could plant trees at home. That has a specific value to, to solving the problem. And if we collectively did that, if everyone, you know, planted one or two trees a month, that's 8 billion, you're going to solve a lot of problems that are currently in existence. And uh, we, we provide a reward to facilitate that and to encourage behavior. So again, you know, you can do it from a financial perspective, but again, if you look at the human problems of the world, there's uh, poverty all over the world. There's over a billion people in poverty. There's something called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is a list of problems that the United Nations have identified. And the first one is poverty. How do we eliminate poverty? So what we are trying to do, or I mean, one corresponding solution that happens as of us doing this is if people can make a living wage out of restoring nature, then you, you can potentially mobilize 8 billion people. Aside from the 8 billion people, which is all of us, but the 1 billion people to be professionally restoring nature. Now, again, you know, pragmatically, we don't know how that's going to go. But also, I mentioned there's only trees, which, you know, in this example, but it's not just trees. Any sort of activity that reverses human damage to nature can be rewarded. So climate change, trees, biodiversity, you know, helping animals, things like uh, plastic pollution, uh, there's a lot of ocean plastics. If you restore nature, then those are things that people can get rewarded. And you'll find that the global, the, the disadvantaged regions of the world, they tend to be the most polluted as well. And if you can pick, you can tie them both together, then you, know, you have a double win. So full disclosure, I am a member of Sustain Credits. I, I, I support what you're doing. And uh, I, just to let you know, I haven't posted this yet, but I went on a, a short walk from my apartment here. And just in a little two mile walk the other morning, I picked up, you know, a pretty reasonable size bag full of plastic litter that had just been thrown out of car windows or whatever. And it's small, right? It's a small little contribution, but that's something that is helping nature not to be polluted, right? So that's that's a very small example of what you're you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, you know, like, for example, using that example, plastics, they degrade into microplastics and nanoplastics. And that's not normally a problem if it was a natural compound, but it's what is known as a normal chemical, because it's a chemical structure that does not exist here on Earth or anywhere else in space. And it, at the rate of release of that, it causes lots of problems. And eventually back to us, and we can look at lots of, there's lots of medical research coming around about the permeability of these micro and nanoplastics that go into the organs. So they can penetrate the blood brain barrier. And there's not a lot of human studies as yet because plastics have been around for 80 years and humans obviously live 80 years. So, but they've found on hermit crabs, microplastics in their brain affects their reproductive behavior and aggressive behavior. So, so it can affect those things. And, and the evolution, things you know, move, things move up the food chain. And so inevitably they, they will make their way to, to, to humans. I like what you yeah. said about, you know, a lot of the things are admonitions of don't do this and don't do that. And you're, you're more about the, the positive side of that. I think in the same sort of way, you know, when, when people communicate often around products, it's like something is free of something. It's PVC free or it's some something that's been decided to be bad. And they're telling you what they're not. They're not telling you what they are. And so I think this this is one of the things that I think we have to do when we communicate is to flip the, flip the script and to be talking about the things that we that are and the things that we are going to do rather than the rather than the opposite. So to give a, give me an example of how you how you value some of these actions that people are taking. I mean, I'm seeing on your social media feed lots of people posting pictures of the things they're doing all over the world, which is great to see. So talk a little bit about you know how they get recompensed for what they're doing and a, a sense of how some of that growth that you're seeing the growth in people joining and and you know what's actually happening on the ground. Okay, so uh, sustain so credits is. To visualize sustainable credits, you need to think of it like a coin. So it has two sides to it. 
heads and tails. Uh, if you're thinking from a business perspective, it's a two-sided market. Uh, and I'll get back to that. So on one side, you have the nature restoration, uh, which is the acts people take. Uh, now, again, if these are going to be rewarded with uh, monetary equivalent, there needs to be another side, which brings in the income to back the reward system. Otherwise, it's just a one-way street and, you know, yeah, the funding it, it does not work. From, funding has to come from somewhere, yeah. Yeah, so uh, from a business perspective, what we do is we, we develop both of these uh, Avenue, so two sides of the coin, one side, we have to, they both have to go simultaneously. And uh, let's talk the grassroots action side of things. So, because you cited that example. So, uh, when people take action, they take proof. We need to see proof. And proof would be photos or videos with the exact location. And this is required for verification purposes and for a database and so on. And once you send it through to us, we evaluate um, the proof and everything that you've said you are. And also we establish a trusted, trusted relationship because again, you know, we need to know who you are. And if it's, if there's information lacking, it doesn't quite, you know, cover the basis. So, uh, and based on what you have provided, we will evaluate and issue sustained credits uh, in relation to the work that you've done. So, uh, for example, planting trees that covers uh, biodiversity and climate change, both of them at the same time. Um, and that has a specific uh, value of sustained credits. And if you, for example, go litter picking or clearing up plastics, that has a different value uh, because trees are quantifiable in, in how many trees have been planted and plastics obviously uh, it can have a mug or it can be a bag, a, a complete bag full of litter. So based on the volume and what it is, we issue sustained credits. Now, measuring one element of nature to another and what is the interplay, that's uh, that's a challenge. I don't, I don't know if anyone knows the answer and I don't know if anyone can ever or will know the answer. How much is a plastic versus how, a tree? We don't know. Uh, yeah, so, so you have to be pragmatic and make some some you know, generalization or or rule setting that yeah seems at least on its face to be to be fair or reasonable. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we, I mean, obviously to figure out well, there's two ways you can value that. One is through supply demand, as in how many how much plastics are you getting versus how many trees you're planted, and then correspondingly do it that way. That's the market based way of valuing that aspect of work. The other avenue is how much human effort has been expended in doing that work. So the plant tree takes this much uh, to collect, you know, 10 bottles of plastic from the ocean. It takes this much and so on. So we don't know yet. We're still, you know, we're still tweaking it around based on everything that we're getting. Um, and that's how it is right now. But ultimately, it will be a complete supply demand system. Uh, and we will tell that the market... Uh, you know, dictate to us what it is with oversight from the scientific process. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I spoke about two sides of the coin. So I spoke about how uh, nature restoration gets awarded sustained credits. And how do we bring money is we batch the work that's happened and the nature restoration that has been collectively done by earth doctors or our users. And we uh, look at selling these uh, acts to businesses. So you might have well, you know, I'm I'm uh, you know in my particular case just to give another example I'm I'm actually on both sides of the coin right because I've chosen to um be part of sustained credit on the provision of funding to help that side of the equation and I've also just collected a couple of kilograms of plastic on my walk and so hopefully when I post a video you'll you know, I'll get some credit back for whatever that work is is worth. So I'm at, I'm actually operating on both sides, but you can choose to be on one or the other or both, right? All three. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, you, I mean, the thing is now, now if I'm talking commercials, uh, now who 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 is interested in paying for this? So you, as an individual, you as a person involved with nature and ecology, you chose to pay. So that would be known as a B two C uh, customer. So. 
a customer as a person is buying from us the, the individual acts of each restoration. Uh, then there's also the B2B aspect, which is businesses. Uh, and our focus uh, is to go for businesses because ultimately it's, I mean, again, it's, it's a philosophical debate and I don't want to get into that, but potentially, you know, most of the nature damage that has occurred has happened because of business practices. Um, and also, you know, if you focus on businesses, then then there's a lot more money to be collectively had from businesses as opposed to individuals, even though, you know, if you get 1 billion paying customers, that's worth a lot more than, yeah. you know, 10 businesses and so on. Uh, uh, but also businesses currently have a need for this sort of action because, you know, you turn on the news, you hear about climate change and net zero. And if you, uh, if you, if you, are looking to purchase something and there's an advert that you see on radio or on, on TV, they'll say, for, this is carbon neutral. So you buy a car, this is carbon neutral, they would say. So what does that mean? Uh, so what businesses currently do is uh, for they would estimate the carbon that they think they're expending, and then they would figure out how many trees need to be planted to offset it. To, yeah, and then they would contact uh, a business in another part of the world to plant that many trees. Um, so say you're buying a car and then it says it's carbon neutral and then as they say that's uh, 100 trees, let's say, to offset that process. Now that business could pay someone to plant 100 trees in, say, Madagascar, or they could come to us and buy the same 100 trees, but it's been planted by a lady in Kenya by one by you can uh, in your garden perhaps mm -hmm. uh, someone in Pakistan and and this collectively gets the same result and so it's, uh, a, it's a more di more distributed model where the exactly trees are planted yeah. anywhere in the world rather yeah. than saying I'm I'm making a little project in one particular you know hectare of of, of a country somewhere. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, what we also find is uh, there's a lot of waste in terms of um, the finances also, uh, because say, you know, say you're company A and you want to plant, say, 10,000 trees uh, in Madagascar, so what you would do is you contact uh, the tree planting enterprise in Madagascar, and then you would buy those trees, and what they would do is they would contact workers, pay them close to minimum wage in that location and they will keep some profit as well. So what actually gets down to the person who's actually doing the work is minimal. So with, with our process, the, the purchase, you know, aside from our, our operations fee, goes straight to the person who's actually doing the work uh, without those trickle-down middleman you know, in a transaction costs. More, it's a more direct relationship, yeah. So yeah. Talk about some of the people who you who you who you've got on the planting and doing side, and then let's talk. Finish up by talking about the sort of um, companies that you're looking for who you know who fit the the, the model. So right. So where that, are you seeing the growth in people who are actually doing things? Because that's where I see a lot of posts. Right? Okay. So we've been going for two years now, just under, um, and. We have been focusing on getting the nature restoration done because uh, it's a catch-22. Uh, what comes first? So, so we focused on getting people on the case. So, uh, so in those two years, we are in 99 countries around the world, um, and that's pretty, pretty epic growth. I would, I would think, uh, based on what we've done, and uh, we've got uh, just over 35,000 users and our, our users are known as earth doctors uh, in in those places and we see people from all walks of life uh, people like retired ladies to uh, children school kids to professional replanters to plastic disposal people to conservation people um and we've got a huge plethora of you know all types of people, all walks of life, and the, from the poorest person to some of the most wealthiest people as well. 
Um, and what we find is uh, in terms of tree planting, uh, it's mostly from Asia South and Southeast Asia um, and also Africa as well. Uh, but Southeast Asia in, is higher in our system. Um, and in terms of plastic pollution and all of that, uh, it tends to be Europe and and also Philippines as well. Uh, there's also some from uh, West Africa and so on. I mean, I'm just quoting numbers. I mean, this is what I've seen. And um, I can give you a couple of uh, examples. So I'll give, you a, uh, I'll give you an example of a European. So we've got uh, Paul Way, who's based in the Netherlands. And he's very passionate about nature. And he, there's an activity he does call, known uh, called plogging. And plogging is... It's, it's it's like you're running and then you're picking up it on the process. So he goes for a run every day and whenever he sees uh, litter or other chemicals in places where it shouldn't be, he would pick them up and then he would dispose it. Uh, and what he would do is, again, because he's based in the Netherlands, he, uh, again, you know, the financial aspect doesn't contribute to him too much, you know, even if he were to make, say, a euro each time, a euro will not buy him much, maybe a bottle of water. Uh, but if that euro was sent through to, say, Senegal, that euro would go a much longer way mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, what the purchasing power is. So he chooses to donate his reward to someone else who is doing the same thing. So in a way, he's doubling his... Is good. Right. He's, he's already doing something nature positive action, and then he's whatever he earns, he gives it to someone else. So um, that, that's how then, he's choosing to be on both sides of the of the network. Yeah, yeah. Um, taking the proceeds from one side and investing it in the other. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but and then you have someone else. So I'll quote, and this gentleman is uh, his, his name is Pavan Ladda. He's from India. Uh, from a little city called Latur in Maharashtra, which is the biggest state in India, I think. And he has been planting trees nonstop. He's taken it up on himself to completely greenify, I don't know if that's a word, greenify his city. It, it used to be a uh, you know, pretty polluted sort of place. And he's been doing it for three, four years now, maybe only four now. And uh, you can see, you know, he's taken pictures before and after. So what he does is he's got a team of uh, friends and volunteers and he's set up a little organization and he goes, um, he goes, he finds all these places within the city and then he plants these trees and he doesn't just plant the trees, he waters them. And again, you know, so he's probably planted, I think, close to 100,000 trees uh, around that mark. And just planting a tree doesn't mean it's going to flourish. It needs to be looked after for you know a few months, and that means you know watering it and that sort of stuff. So he's he's set up the infrastructure he's to nurturing go and do it all as well to make sure that it 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 sustains itself, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, a, a tree is like a child, obviously. So you know, you have a baby, you leave it aside. It's not going to grow into you know a human being. S same sort of thing. Um, and he's someone who's been doing it. And again, he's not someone who does it for reward, but it would be, but he sees it as a bonus. So on the other uh, side, when you're looking for 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 companies uh, who are looking to get some some offsets of some sort, how do they how do they gauge, you know, what how much they need to um, put on the table to get the credit they need to to give them the offset? What well, what's their value exchange? Okay, uh, so a disclaimer first. We've been focusing on the uh, nature restoration aspect, and we haven't been focusing on the commercial aspects yet. And we are we've made a start, um, but I mean, from the conversations I'm having, uh, basically businesses understand. Well, I mean, the it, businesses work on the premise that. A tree that's planted uh, sequesters 25 kilograms of uh, CO2 every year. So that's the metric they're working on. So if they were to release, say, one ton uh, of CO2, then they would need 40 trees. Uh, and they're working on that basis. 
Uh, now, that is a bit problematic because they work well. They don't take additionality into consideration, or, right. or the fact that they, they assume that you put a tree, plant, plant a tree, and then all the trees are going to go into fruition. But the truth is, uh, thirty percent of the trees die uh, that are planted, um, and also that twenty-five kilo per tree is it's a uh, it's a best case scenario. So not all well, trees and, and growth doesn't go on forever, right? It's to, a tree grows to a maximum height and then it's it's reached its maturity. So there's yeah. So so I mean, pace, so the yield aspect. goes down. Yeah, the well, I mean the thing is, and that's that's one of the limitations with carbon credits and all of that because they just focus on carbon. But a tree that's grown into fruition has about I mean okay you can okay I mean you can look at animal husbandry. So let's say you take, you feed a chicken and you grow it for meat, and then you have to uh, butcher it within, you know, X number of days because afterwards any feed it takes is wasted because you have to pump in the feed. Um, and and so, some of the carbon products work on that premise, but and that's one of the limitations because that only fact takes into account the fact that trees are carbon sequestration. Machines. A, tree, a tree is much more than just a carbon sequestering element it's, or thing. It's also emitting oxygen. It's providing habitat and shade and, you know, lots of other nature services that also have... Yeah, a, ecosystem. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, just the carbon, yeah. And, and the other thing is, okay, since we're on this topic, so um, carbon dioxide, or climate change is just one aspect, uh, and it is critical, obviously, uh, because I think 100 years ago, there, there were 200... 20 something parts per million of CO2 versus 430 something uh, parts per million. So it's obviously doubled into uh, that's that's considerable. But an even, even more worrying stat is in the last 50 years, there's been a 70% reduction of biodiversity. Um, I would say that's even more considerable than, uh, right. than just the carbon, yeah. Yeah, because CO, well, obviously CO two you can sort of reverse. You sort of have a template. You stop all activity and you plant trees, and it's fine. But biodiversity is something that's taken millions of years of evolution to get to a specific stage, and we've just wiped out seventy percent of it in fifty years. And some of the animals and are extinct, and some we don't know what we can do. So, but I think I think, I think well, coming back to the tree side of things, you know. A tree can be maintained, and then they provide lots of additional services, and then that provides habitat for biodiversity. There'll be more squirrels or birds or exotic species running around. There might be you know, foxes and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so the carbon, yeah. the carbon is being prioritized mainly because that's an issue that a lot of businesses are being very conscious of right now. But the trees, pr trees providing way more than just a carbon sink. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think that's the thing. When a measure becomes the target, it ceases to be a good measure. So it's sort of been the target the last 20 years. And now businesses, are, obviously, there's always a delay. Now everyone's focusing on that. But I think the next thing is everything else. And uh, again, trees would be... And, and one of the other things is, uh, again, you know, if you look at so life, you can break it down into flora and fauna. And biodiversity would be fauna. And how do you get back fauna? And I think the op first one is to get the flora up, which is trees and you know plants and all of that. And once it's that, then you get then the flora, sorry, the fauna returns. That and that's is, when, by the way, that's my next that's my next project that you'll be seeing. I've been planting plants um, which attract the monarch butterfly, which is in pretty desperate straits, and um, so you you'll be seeing that in the next few weeks. I look forward to it. Let's let's just cl close out for today on who you're looking for now. You're looking then to 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 get more businesses that have this this need for um for offsets and uh, and enroll them and enlighten them in in what you're doing. And uh, what's what's the best way for for a business to you know connect with sustained credits? Uh uh, just hit, drop me an email, lanks at sustainedcredits.com, fairly simple, L-A-N-K-S at sustainedcredits.com. You can visit our website, sustainedcredits.com. You can follow us on social media, on all, any social media, sustained credits, uh, and it basically has all the instructions. Um, 
uh, on how you can join. You can join as an individual who's, who's restoring nature and then be rewarded. Or if you are a business, you have a bunch of options there as well. I will put in the in the blurb with the podcast all those links and uh, and things so that people can easily click through from the podcast. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Uh, but I mean, it's quite uh, you know straightforward. Just visit our website and it's all possible. And because we are early stage at the moment, which is the first couple of years, uh, we are very flexible in terms of catering to the needs of businesses. So if uh, businesses have you know very specific needs, we can do it. And also the fact that we are holistic as opposed to a tiny niche. By that I mean, so if you look at say carbon credits and tree planting is just one, but we cover every aspect of it and we are globally reached. We can give a tailor a solution to suit the needs of the business with the caveat that you with the caveat that we reserve the right to refuse your business if we feel that you're using this unethically for greenwashing purposes, which again defeats the purpose. So we are very, very curious because ultimately we are not here to uh, make money and well we are here to make money but obviously our priority is the purpose comes first and the profit sort of goes hand in hand mm -hmm. as opposed to profit and then you know get rid of the purpose a bit uh, and so on yeah and, and the the whole question of, of, of greenwashing is is clearly also of the moment so it's understandable that you want to be um very clear about what's what's an acceptable use and what's what's stepping over the line so where where um where do you where do you see sustained credits and Earth Doctor being a year from now? What's your what's your sort of short term one year um, expectation that we can hopefully enroll more people on both sides of your network and and see if we can accelerate what you're trying to do here? I'll give you a little bit of an internal view, so not necessarily what you can expect from the outside. Um, in the first couple of years, we sort of built everything and we now have a good uh, understanding of the landscape. We know exactly what needs to happen. So what we are doing now is rebuilding the systems with the view to setting up firm foundations that will last for a long time. So in the next uh, three to six months, we are looking at uh, revamping our technology and making it even more accessible and uh, more trustworthy uh, because I think some of the issues with some of the existing, not with us, but with other people, is you know, verification. There's a lot of fraud happening. So we don't want any of that. So we, we work on maximum transparency. So we are rebuilding everything so everyone can see exactly what's happening uh, in terms of the movement and what people are doing. Uh, simultaneously, what we're looking at doing is uh, developing business uh, work streams. Uh, so we can sell these onto businesses and uh, Again, that is an important priority as well, because the more revenue we have, the more it, that is available to people to restore nature. Uh, so that goes hand in hand. So we are sort of incentivized, in addition to a traditional business being incentivized to make lots of profit, we are incentivized to seek as much revenues as possible, because the more revenue we have, the more that's available to people, the more revenue that's available to people, the more nature restoration happens. Uh, for example, at the moment, e sustained credit is valued uh, at 0 0.25 pounds, so it's a fraction of a penny. And that's because our commercials are minimal at this stage, but we hope that it can, we'll have sufficient revenues to make each sustained credit uh, 20 pence. I'm using pounds, so it's probably around 25 cents US. And with that valuation, someone who's dedicated can uh, make between five and 10 pounds an hour, about six to 12 dollars a US, I think. Uh, and that is an excellent wage for 99% of the world, uh, aside from you, know, you and me, who are a bit more fortunate in one of the more privileged countries. Right. Uh, and so we, we're doing everything we can to get there. So in about 12 months' time, hopefully, we would have reached um, maybe not 20, 20 pence as a stand credit, maybe five, let's say, I don't know, five, five pence. Um, and yeah, so, you, so you, have, we, you have a trajectory to try and progressively increase the, the value of the, of the sustained credit. 
Yeah, but it, again, it change, it fluctuates as well because say we it goes to one pound, let's say hypothetical, then people will see each sustained credit is one pound, and then they will do a lot more nature restoration, which means the supply side of sustained credits right. goes up. So then that goes down. So at some point it'll normalize. We don't know at what point that will that will be, but that would be an excellent problem to have. The fact that people are actually restoring nature to make uh, income because the income that they can make is very high. Yeah, uh, because right now equilibrium going on. Yeah, yeah, because right now people are sort of doing it um, not for financial reasons, but because they are passionate about nature. They feel like doing something, and they sort of believe in what we are trying to do. Um, but as soon as there's a financial incentive that is, you know, pragmatic, then there will be a lot more happening. Right, right. So we hope to be there. And also along the way, I think we've been nominated to lots of uh, these prizes and awards. Uh, for example, there's the Earthshot Prize by uh, Sir David Attenborough and Prince William. Uh, it's, it's, they've sort of designed it to be the Nobel Prize of uh, Environmental Awards. Um, we've been nominated last year. We've got 18 nominations, which I think is the most by any sort of initiative. Uh, we didn't get anywhere last year because we were under a year old at that time. Um, and this year we've been nominated again with 12 nominations. Again, I think that's the most by any sort of initiative. Yeah, we've got the patronage of the Prince and Sir David Dettenbra and then it's all broadcasted all over the world. And also there's a significant award as well, which will help us accelerate our uh, growth plan. So I'm just giving you a little bit of a startup for the business view. Sure. And with any sort of startup, you're dealing with lots of uncertainty. If it's an established business, there is uncertainty, but it's not significant. The startup that's embarking on something creative that hasn't has never been done before, uh, lots of things are in flux. So I can't really predict, but that's sort of the goal that yeah. we're focusing on the and how that manifests. We'll, well, I think we'll that's, that's where you start. You start with the intentionality and then see, as you say, how, how much you can manifest and at what pace. I, I think this is a very exciting initiative, Langs. I, I really thank you for for putting your brain power behind it and your time behind it. And um, you know you have my support. And let's uh, see if we can get a lot more people to do a lot more things on both sides of the coin. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for your support. Uh, you're one of our customers. You're also one of our doctors. And thanks for the interview. Uh, you know, really liked your questions. Um, and Hopefully we can work more together and uh, I'll, I will keep you posted. Uh, it's sort of direct. We have an open book policy here. Everything is fully disclosed. And uh, as one of our first you know, customers from our commercial streams, you will be up to speed and maybe we can work together in taking in your feedback, which I think you get from your audience and everyone you deal with to make our product even more suited to fixing the problem at hand and also a success. So thank you. Well, my, my pleasure. I think the the action orientation that you have is, is so important. Uh, it's much more than, than talking, it's the actual doing. And um, it's not the don't, it's the do's, as you said, right from the beginning. And uh, thank you very much for all you do. Thanks, Ken. Thank you.